Hi, everyone. Uh, well, the latest in the series of LPC webinars brought to you by the Professional Development Committee. I'm Hillary Corbett from Northeastern University. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I believe Courtney is going to mute everyone's microphone. Uh, we will have uh, Q&A at the end of the presentation when you can unmute yourselves or you can submit questions through the chat box throughout. And Kevin has said he'll pick up on questions if they seem to fit in with what he's talking about at the time. Otherwise, we'll kind of gather them all together for the end. So our topic today is publication agreements. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Kevin Smith is the new Dean of Libraries at the University of Kansas, but many of us know him from his previous role as Director of Copyright and Scholarly Communication at Duke University, where he established a well-deserved reputation as a leader in the field of copyright and fair use. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. But today, of course, we're talking about publication agreements. Um, my intention in this webinar is to give you both some principles for thinking about publication agreements and also lots of examples. I will be talking mostly from the perspective of authors and folks who help authors understand and negotiate publication agreements. I do recognize that some of you may be thinking about actually drafting publication agreements for uh, library publishing operations. Happy to talk about that. I'll try and introduce it in a couple of spots and we can talk about it in the q and A. I'm coming at this from the perspective I'm most comfortable with, but please take me off in the direction that matters to you. We're a relatively small group, so we can do that if you want to. The only other thing I want to say before I get started is that uh, for all of the publication agreements that I'm going to show you excerpts from, I have told you who the publisher is. I have not changed the names, nor have I deleted them. I have copies of all the contracts that are quoted. So uh, even though publishers frequently change their agreements or use different contracts in different situations, these are real examples from the publishers who I mention. Nevertheless, as I say, they do change, so your mileage may vary. But um, I didn't want to do sort of a generic, this is what some publisher says. So I have left the names in. All right, let's get started. Um, the most basic thing to say about publication agreements is that they are contracts. Um, now, a contract is not a big scary trap like a lot of people think that it is. A contract is nothing more than a promise that the law will enforce. Um, it's a promise related to a specific organizational or personal goal. Um, contracts are very easy to form. I've given you a couple of examples there. There's the printed contract. There's the handshake, and even a wedding ceremony uh, is a way to form a contract. Uh, contracts are very simple to create. They just involve three elements. The first is that there must be an offer. I will do X if you do Y. Um, there must be acceptance of that offer. OK, let's shake on it. But also, acceptance can be implied. Um, the classic example is you offer me $20 to go wash your car. I don't say yes, I don't say no, but 10 minutes later I'm out there washing your car. I've accepted the contract and you're now obligated. My actions implied acceptance. That's perfectly possible and it's important when we think about online agreements. And then there must be consideration. Consideration is just a mutual benefit. Both sides must get something out of the contract. Uh, the law doesn't look at whether or not the consideration is appropriate or fair or balanced. There just has to be something. So we get to decide what we want from the other side when we enter into a contract. But there has to be some exchange of mutual benefit. That's all it takes. So you can see why the handshake and the wedding ceremony are perfectly legitimate forms of contract formation. So that's the basics about contracts. That would take you a whole semester in law school to learn. Um, so, but let's talk for a minute about lawyers. Many people feel like they need a lawyer to form a contract. But if you were paying attention, I just told you that contracts 
are formed very easily and actually get formed all the time without lawyers. So it's very possible to create a contract without a lawyer. There are no magic words. There is no magic language that has to be in a contract. A contract is a business document. It's intended to help both parties get something they want for a particular purpose. Um, lawyers can help with the language. Usually what they can do is make the language very specific, make sure that it does exactly what the client wants it to do and doesn't do other things. They can help understand terms of art. Uh, but terms of art are not the same as magic language. You don't have to have them in a contract. You do not have to have whereas, uh, here and after. You do not have to have that language. Um, you'll see it in some of the examples I'm going to show you because <coughs> lawyers are used to it and because um, sometimes it's helpful. Neither of those words are particularly helpful. Um, but two, two sides of this coin. Just because a lawyer wrote it, does not mean the contract is good for your purpose. And secondly, um, if you take a contract to a lawyer and say, is this okay? The lawyer should never tell you, yeah, sure, that's okay, uh, without talking to you about what you want it to do. If you don't know that the contract does what you need it to do for your business purpose, it's not okay, no matter what the lawyer tells you. I want to tell you a quick story here, and I won't even change the name here, um, about illustrating that just because a lawyer wrote it, it's not necessarily uh, good. A university press, uh, it was Syracuse University Press, publishes a series on modern Hebrew literature. And at Duke, I had a faculty member who had written a 600-page manuscript on that topic. And Syracuse was going to publish it in their series. And they sent him a contract that he found rather disturbing. And he sent it on to me, and I found it very disturbing. It uh, was much more restrictive and one-sided than uh, most publication contracts, and that's saying something. Uh, one of the things it did was it not only required that he indemnify the press, it was very specific about what he was indemnifying them for. It really focused on libel and other forms of defamation, obscenity, um, things that were probably not a real issue for a 600-page manuscript in Hebrew literature. Uh, it also was very specific about the transfer of derivative work rights. Uh, it mentioned theme parks and video games specifically. Now, I was trying to imagine the theme park in modern Hebrew literature. Uh, and it's really quite a fun exercise if you have the time for it. But um, it was clear to me that this was not a contract that was originally written for an academic publishing house. Um, and I think that what happened was that the press picked up a contract from some other branch of publishing and basically thought, if a lawyer wrote it, it must be okay. And that's what I want to tell you is never, ever okay. It's got to do what you want the contract to do. In this case, by the way, I think that Syracuse had borrowed a contract that was originally used for publishing graphic novels. And in that situation, the concern about, about defamation, about obscenity, the, the hope that there will be theme parks and, and uh, video games, all makes perfectly good sense. It was appropriate for its original business purpose, but not for a subsequent one. <clears throat> Excuse me. So anyway, I just want to encourage you to think carefully and in a circumspect way about what the role of the lawyer is when you're either looking at a contract or drafting one. So publication agreements, specific kinds of contracts. You want to look for mutual promises. Remember I told you there has to be consideration. That means both sides have to get something. So look to see what the author is giving. Um, usually that's going to be a transfer of copyright or a license. And look to see what the publisher promises. And this is something that I think a lot of authors don't realize. Most publication contracts do not publish, do not promise publication. They promise review. Uh, 
Um, so you want to look, for example, for language that says, if the article or the manuscript is not accepted, um, this contract is void, co uh, copyright is only transferred upon publication or upon acceptance, um, there will often be uh, limitations on what the publisher is promising and with what actually triggers the mutual promises. Uh, so look for that. If an article is not accepted in these contracts, usually that's going to be addressed in some way in the agreement. Either it will say that the transfer is invalid or it will say that uh, the transfer only occurs upon acceptance. Um, even if the contract doesn't say this, if ultimately the, uh, the publisher does not accept the manuscript, it's possible at least that the transfer of copyright would be invalid due to lack of consideration. In other words, there would have been nothing given by the publisher that would make this a valid contract because there'd be mutual consideration. But I would be, I always look here just because I want to make sure that the transfer of copyright is either voided or doesn't happen if the article isn't accepted. A badly written contract could create problems that you don't need here. So that's, that's the first thing to look for. Are there mutual promises and what happens if one side doesn't meet the promise that they made? Of course, if it just says review and there's a transfer of copyright, you know, I transfer copyright and you publisher promise to review, and then you decide not to take my article, that's why it's really important that it that there be some kind of language that says the transfer of copyright would be void. Otherwise, there may actually be consideration on both sides. Both sides did what they said they wanted to do, and I end up having surrendered my copyright in an article that didn't get published. That would be the bad situation that you wanted to avoid here. So a little more about copyright. We often talk about copyright as a bundle of sticks. That is, it's a bunch of different rights. It's an exclusive right over copying, distribution, public performance, public display, the preparation of derivative works, and digital uh, broadcast of sound recordings. Those are the six sticks in the copyright bundle. Um, what's actually being transferred in the copyright agreement? Is the entire bundle being transferred? Um, we should remember that a transfer or assignment, and those words mean the same thing, a transfer or assignment of copyright must be in writing. So it can't be done in the casual way that I described the contract for washing a car. Um, there has to be a written document. The copyright law tells us that. Um, but look to see what exactly is being transferred. Is it all of the rights or only some of them? Of course, some of these agreements are not transfers of copyright. They are licenses. In a license, the original rights holder continues to hold the right, but they give permission to somebody else to exercise all or part of those rights. Licenses can address only part of the copyright bundle, uh, even less than one whole stick, if you will. Um, they can address uh, they can distribute the sticks uh, to different people in different formats. They can impose time limits. Licenses are extremely flexible. They can mix and match the rights in the copyright bundle in almost any imaginable way. You really are only limited by what you can think up when you're drafting a license. Um, so most publication agreements do transfer copyright, and then they license some portion of the sticks usually some very carefully circumscribed portion of the sticks, back to the author. That is what we call retained rights. Technically, they're licensed back to the author because copyright has been transferred to a new rights holder, the publisher, and what the agreement is doing in saying you can still do these things is licensing some part of the copyright bundle back to the authors. So let me give you a couple of examples of this kind of language. Here are two different clauses that transfer copyright to the publisher. Um, 
they're they're not really different in very significant ways. It's always interesting to see what is of concern to the different publishers. So the first one is the the central clause in a Springer agreement uh, that transfers copyright to the publisher. Um, and notice that it says that the transfer of the copyright, assignment is the word it's used here, uh, the copyright in this article, including any graphic elements, and they want to make sure they get all those rights, is hereby assigned, that's the same as transferred, for good and valuable consideration. It's acknowledging that there is consideration, which I told you is part of what you need uh, for a contract, to Springer, effective if and when the article is accepted for publication. Really important. That's where they say this is the transfer, but only if something happens. It's contingent. It's a conditional transfer. Um, and this is really important because, as I said, what happens if the, co if the article is not accepted for publication? You don't want copyright to have transferred. So this is carefully written to make sure you understand that you're only transferring copyright when the article is accepted. And then it goes on to mention that there are certain authors, such as those who work for the United States government or the British government or any of the other governments that have a so-called crown copyright, um, they may have laws that restrict the ability of those authors to transfer copyright. So Springer is acknowledging that and saying it's only assigned to us, the copyright, uh, to the extent that the law allows, which makes perfectly good sense. The AMA does not, um, well, it does. It specifies when copyright is transferred in consideration of the actions of the American Medical Association in reviewing and editing. I transfer, assign, or otherwise convey. That's the lawyer who uses three words when, when only one would do. Uh, they're synonyms. Uh, all copyright ownership, including any and all rights incidental there, too. And they're very concerned about making sure that they have the rights for manuscripts, tables, figures, video, audio, and other supplementary files to the AMA in the event that such work is published by the AMA. Once again, they're saying this only happens if we actually publish the uh, the article. And it's very important to make sure that that language or some version of it is in there. Now here's an example. Oops, sorry, advanced too far. Here's an example of a license. And this is a license to the Social Sciences Research Network, which is now owned by Elsevier, as we know from announcements made last week. Um, SSEP is the parent organization of SSRN. And here you see a very different kind of treatment of copyright. Users of SSRN grant to the, this parent organization a limited, non-exclusive, worldwide, royalty-free, revocable license to perform the services. And when you see that capitalized word, you know that somewhere else the exact services uh, that SSRN will perform are defined. And, uh, and then it's repetitive. These are written, this was written by a lawyer, I'm sure. Uh, you grant this non-exclusive, royalty-free, perpetual, worldwide, revocable license to your content in connection with the services. And that includes the rights, and it specifies which rights. Um, now, this is a non-exclusive license, which means the rights holder, the author, can still do all of these things, too. He, he or she can make copies, distribute them, transmit them, publicly display them, allow others to do those things, translate, um, and reformat digital or non-digital uh, content, and incorporate it into a collective work. It's very useful that SSRN um, spells this out so that authors know that they have granted a non-exclusive license, that they can continue to do all these things, and that they can also do them uh, or license other people to do them. It's royalty free. Nobody is getting paid here. It's perpetual. It lasts forever, but it's also revocable, which means the author can revoke it. I know that seems contradictory, but those, those words are used differently. Perpetual defines the time of the license, the time that the license lasts. Revocable creates an option for the author to void the license, to pull it back, to say, no, no, I didn't mean to do that. 
So I'm going to show you one more license, and then maybe I'll, I'll stop briefly. I'm moving very quickly, I notice, which is very unusual for me, actually. Um, so I'll, I'll stop and see if you have any questions. So if you do, uh, please go ahead and type them into the chat now, and I'll, I'll show you one more license before we get to that. This is the license from Nature. Nature uses an exclusive license, not a transfer of copyright and not a non-exclusive license. We've seen both of those. Um, this says right up front what the promise is that Nature Publishing Group uh, is making, and that promise is the consideration for the license. So in consideration of Nature Publishing Group agreeing to publish the contribution. Now this says agreeing to publish the contribution. I don't know whether, I think probably this is the case, that authors don't get this agreement until an article has already been accepted. Um, so here, if that's the case, this really doesn't make any difference. Um, and of course, if for some reason Nature did not agree to publish, then the contract would be void. Um, so that's the consideration. The author's grant to Nature Publishing for the full term of copyright um, and any extensions there too, anything that happens later. You know, if we extend the copyright uh, term for another 20 years, uh, Nature will still hold that longer term. And it's an exclusive license to publish, reproduce, distribute, or display and store. Um, exclusive here means not only that the author cannot license other people to do this, but the author probably can't do these things herself. So when you look at how comprehensive the rights that are licensed are, um, so it's reproduce, publish, reproduce, distribute, display, store, um, in print, digital, or electronic uh, form throughout the world to translate the contribution, to create adaptations, summaries, or extracts, or any other derivative work based on the contribution to exercise all the rights set forth in A in such translations, adaptations, summaries, extracts, and derivative works, and to license others to do all of the above. If you're giving nature an exclusive license to do all of these things, ask yourself, what is left? Is there any difference here between what nature uh, is taking in this license and an assignment of copyright. One of the interesting things about the Nature License, and this isn't on your screen, is it has a similar kind of give back clause where a license is given back to the author um, to do specific things. And it says in that give back clause, you, the author, are still the copyright holder and you have the right to do these things. And another way to think about the question I just asked is, does being the rights holder matter here? Because the license is so comprehensive and exclusive, the only thing that the author can continue to do with her own work are the things that are licensed back in the contract. So effectively, this has the same impact as a transfer of copyright. When I looked at this, I thought about the famous situation from now quite a few years ago when a fairly unknown author published a novel with, I can't remember who the small academic press was, but the novel was really kind of a reflection on uh, military technology and specifically submarine technology, but it was cast in the form of a novel. And of course, that unknown author was Tom Clancy and the novel was The Hunt for Red October, which became a very big hit, and of course a famous movie with Sean Connery in it. Um, who, would, who would make the profit from that if you wrote an article? I always wanted to meet the graduate student who wrote a, a dissertation that was turned into a movie. Um, you know, if you wrote that article that became The Hunt for Red October, who would get the profit? I think that under this license, even though the author is technically still the rights holder, um, that opportunity and that profit would go to nature. All right, I promise to take a break uh, and 
give some time for questions. Nobody's typed anything into the chat box. This is Hillary. Yeah, I don't see anything either. I have a couple of questions to ask you myself, um, but I will uh, stand back if there are others out there. If you want to ask a question uh, by speaking rather than typing, I see somebody just typed something in, just feel free to unmute yourself and then mute yourself again after you uh, ask. So it looks like Allegra Swift has a question there. Yes. Do you see that, Kevin? Yes, I do. Uh, and it's the question is, what if the uh, agreement they have online in the policies is not the same as the agreement that the author actually clicks through? Um, okay, I can't tell if there's more to that. That was the agreement. In any case, the short answer to this question is that the agreement to which the author has done something to manifest assent Remember I said there had to be offer, acceptance, and consideration. The click-through is acceptance. Our courts have said that there has to be, usually our courts have said, they haven't been entirely consistent, that there has to be a affirmative act of acceptance. Click-through is good enough. They even said in a famous case called Pro CD versus Hindenburg that opening a package, shrink wrap, licenses were enforceable, that opening the package was a form of acceptance. It was a sufficiently affirmative act to accept a contract. Um, on the other hand, so-called browse wrap licenses, that is the button over on the side that says click here to see our terms and conditions, but you don't have to click there. Um, you're not obligated to agree to either go to the site or whatever you're doing are not enforceable generally. So the answer to this question is the agreement that the author clicked through are the terms of the agreement. And what's on the website uh, are not. If there are any differences, the agreement that they clicked through is the one that would be enforceable. Um, so that's an important point for, you know, most publishers now have their, uh, their terms and conditions, especially about self-archiving, up on a website. It's all very nice, and you can look up, you know, when your author doesn't have their contract anymore, you can look up what the author's, the publisher says their uh, agreements were, uh, their rules are, but that's not necessarily going to be enforceable. Um, so, yeah, uh, in this case, the, the, the click-through language is what matters. Uh, how do we negotiate? Really hard to do with an online contract. Um, with a click-through agreement. Um, yeah, that, that's been my thing. Uh, so I've even tried to find out who at the journal to send the email to with the addendum, you know, attachment. And, you know, at these bigger houses, it's really difficult to nail down um, right. who would have the authority to, to make those agreements. Um, whereas right. before you just emailed it in with the submission. Um, and so now, you know, the roadblocks I'm coming against are they either point you back to the NASA's APC um, or there's just like nobody to negotiate with. So the choice of my faculty is to just not submit them if they come up yeah. with a different agreement. And I, and I wish I had a better, uh, a better answer for you, but I think you've got the right answer. Uh, if they cannot live with the language that is in the click-through agreement, um, and they can't find anybody to negotiate with, um, then you really don't have much choice here except to walk away from that publisher. Um, negotiation is very, very difficult. Most of these agreements have a clause that says this is the entire agreement. Um, it's sometimes called a merger clause. Uh, and what it says is that any discussions that we had prior to the acceptance of this agreement uh, are either incorporated into this agreement or they're void. So uh, e even if you, you know, exchange emails with somebody from the publisher and then click through the agreement, and uh, later the publisher says, sorry, those uh, agreements, those emails uh, didn't really mean anything, they're probably right uh, if there was one of these merger clauses. So. Yeah, really, you don't have too many choices with an online uh, 
agreement, especially when the publisher doesn't have the common decency to respond to emails at all. Uh, really just walking away is about the only thing you can do if the terms are not effective, not effective for your particular author. I wish I could tell you something different. Hillary, did you want to bring something up? Yeah, so I was thinking during your presentation about the kinds of things that we as publishers versus we as authors might like to see included in our typical publication agreement. So most um, library publishing operations have an emphasis on open access, first of all. Um, sure. And, you know, I think many probably allow authors to retain their rights um, and rather do a, a, an, a license to a transfer license, uh, for, or a, rather a license to distribute. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, the, the agreements that many of us have probably have in place for deposit in our institutional repositories, which generally, it, it occurred to me when you showed the SSRN license, which used the word revocable, generally with an institutional repository, we're used to saying irrevocable because we want to take things into the repository permanently. We don't want people to be able right. to change their minds later. And I was, it, it occurred to me that perhaps that language might not be appropriate for a publication agreement um, because, I mean, once something is published, it's, it's published, it's in the journal, but would we want to keep that kind of irrevocable language in there if we were publishing a journal, for example, that we didn't want authors to write to us five years from now and say, I changed my mind, unpublish that article? Right. Good question. Um, Two parts of an answer. The first, which is not quite the question you asked, but what I want to say. Um, at, at Duke, we used to have in our open access policy irrevocable, um, but waivable. And I think those two things are, are, are helpful to distinguish. Um, what we meant was the license created by the open access policy could be waived by the author. And it was very specific that the waiver procedure was for faculty at Duke. It required an approval by either the provost or the provost's designee. So it could be waived, but once the license came into existence, it could not be revoked. And that's a fairly obvious point because after this license comes into existence, copyright is very likely going to be transferred to a publisher. And a publisher could very easily then say, we're now the rights holder, we revoke that license. The presumption is that a license is revocable unless it says that it is not. Um, so in that situation, I think the irrevocable language is not only appropriate, but essential. When you're publishing something, I would think, you know, just about the technology. Uh, SSRN can offer a revocable license because it's very easy to take something down. So the first thing, you made this point, Hillary, if it's in print or if it's, a, if it's part of an online journal where you have you know, um, issues that are related to one another and that are perhaps delivered all at the same time, then uh, revocation is going to be very, very difficult. So does the technology make it possible for you to allow revocation? If it doesn't, I would write the license that way. And then just do you want to do it? Um, can you think about what the reasons would be where somebody would want to revoke the license? Um, I no longer believe what I wrote in that article. I don't think it was really all that well written. I've changed my mind radically. Um, the science has proved me wrong. Usually the answer to all of those, most of those, is let's write another article. Let's explain what's changed. Um, so I would think you want to be careful about revocation um, in those situations, but I can imagine where the technology supports it and your sense is that you want to support the reasons your authors might give for revoking. Those are cases where you might permit it. I think I will, you. sure, you're welcome. I think I'll proceed if that's okay, so I make sure I get through my slides. I'm trying to balance time here, uh, and, and we'll talk some more at the end. So let's look at some of the, uh, those givebacks, those licenses back to the author. One of the most common, as I've already said, is uh, about self-archiving, about the ability to put an article 
in a repository. There are usually in most publication agreements, and I think we're seeing this more and more limitations on that right that's given back to authors. Um, often there's an embargo period. We know that Elsevier has just changed their policy or said they did. It's helpful to remember that what they say in their press releases or even on their website is not what ultimately matters. What matters is the agreement that's actually sent to the and agreed to by the author. But anyway, we, I think we're seeing more and more embargoes. The, even the publication agreements that said you can put the author's final manuscript in an institutional repository are now imposing some kind of embargo. And there does seem to be a general agreement in the industry about these embargoes, which is why I think we're starting to see them grow. The type of website, Elsevier again, their new policy makes a distinction between personal websites and institutional repositories. Um, I think that's very foolish. It uh, misunderstands how networks and how the cloud work. Um, so I, I think it's a distinction without a difference, as lawyers like to say, and therefore something that will cause nothing but trouble in these contracts. And then the other thing, of course, is versions. Uh, and we'll talk more about the different versions that uh, publishers distinguish between, if that's not too awkward a sentence, um, in their publication contracts. It was an awkward sentence, by the way. So here's an example from Wiley Blackwell. They have, and I didn't give you all the language because it wouldn't have fit on the screen, but they give you um, a bunch of different rules for different versions. So the submitted version, what we would call the preprint, the version before peer review, uh, can be on a personal website or an employer's repository. Thank you. Uh, that distinction, as I said, doesn't make a whole lot of sense in many cases. It may not be updated, and it still requires the citation to the final publication from Wiley Blackwell. So, you know, it's very clear this, you have to say this is an old version and here's the new version. You can't update it to match the new version. The post peer review version, uh, what Wiley Blackwell calls the accepted version, you can only self archive with a separate agreement. In other words, there's no right given back over that version in the contract. The published version, uh, the final, you know, the PDF, as we often say, can be distributed to your own students. You can use it for oral presentations, and that one fascinates me. Um, it's not clear to me the oral presentation in which Wiley Blackwell would hold rights unless it was an outright reading of the article. I think very few scholarly conferences <laughs> Uh, involve authors standing up and reading a previously published article. So I actually think that this right is pretty meaningless, this grant back to authors. Uh, you can give copies to colleagues upon specific request and without a fee. Um, so, And then there's this one that you can use up to half of the published version in later publications. This is extremely problematic for our students who publish articles prior to finishing their dissertations and want to use those published articles in the dissertation. Um, they probably, since they're almost never going to want to use the, well, would never want to use the pre-peer review version, they either have to get a separate agreement for the accepted version or use no more than half in their dissertation. This really handicaps students who um, now are being pressured to publish two and three articles before they complete their dissertation. Uh, this is a very problematic rule. Wiley is the only publisher that we've encountered real entrenchments, that I have encountered real entrenchments on this issue. Um, and in fact, in the Duke repository, there is one dissertation with a chapter excised because Wiley took this position and would not budge. Uh, so I think that's a very problematic approach. Let me just say a word more about versions. I say this often, I write it often, and people do not believe me. But I'll try again. If you don't believe me, we can talk. Copyright is in the content, not in the version. There is not a separate 
copyright in the preprint, the postprint, and the published version unless they are not substantially similar. And substantial similarity is the criteria that courts use when they try to decide if this work infringes on that work. Um, versions are essentially the creation of the publishers. Because they want to impose these kinds of, these kinds of rules, uh, they're not always as draconian as Wiley Blackwell's rules are, but they want to impose these kinds of rules in order to preserve some kind of exclusivity in the published version, in the thing that they actually sell to their subscribers. So versions are not a natural part of the copyright landscape. Um, once a copyright is transferred, the, owner can, the new owner controls all of the versions of that same contract content. The agreement often stipulates these different uses for different versions, uh, but those stipulations are based on definitions that the publisher creates and puts in the agreement. Um, they are not native, if you will, to copyright, and copyright usually doesn't recognize them. I'm going to say it one more time. Copyright is in the content, not the version. This also is true for an open access policy license. It applies to the content, not the version. So if you have a license to the institution that exists prior to the transfer of copyright and survives it, um, that is a license in the content. And if you choose to exercise the license in this way, and most institutions do not, you can ignore all those rules about versioning um, because the distinction is artificial uh, as far as copyright is concerned. Excuse me, I'm having a little trouble advancing the slides. So this is an agreement for um, self-archiving from American Geophysical Union. It is more generous than most such agreements. It says that authors are allowed to deposit their journal articles if the version is the final published, citable version of record. Um, and there must be a, the copyright statement for, to AGU must be visible, and there's a six-month embargo. Well, six months is better than we're seeing for a lot of publications, and this allows the final published version, which really pleases a lot of our authors. So that's why I say that it's more generous than many. Um, you know, they're very, <laughs> I think there's a certain polemic in those final published citable version of record. Um, they want to establish the thing we own the rights in, the thing that we, well, they own the rights in the content, uh, the thing that we are selling is the citable version of record. Um, that's very important. You see that language a lot with publishers. But in this case, the publisher is saying, because it is that, we want you to use this version. Most publishers say just the opposite. Because it is that, we're not going to let you use it at all. So it's just interesting to see this difference. Um, I wish we saw more of this, uh, this American Geophysical Union. Uh, I don't know that I would have called it generous a few years ago, but things have changed, unfortunately. So some other issues to look for in contracts, and I'll show you lots of examples of these. I'm going to mention uh, these four, indemnification, governing law, work made for hire, and non-compete clauses. And I meant to put in here, and maybe I have it somewhere else, uh, the merger clause, but I've already talked about that, the, uh, the clause that says this agreement is the only agreement between us and it supersedes any oral or written agreements that preceded it. All right, so two of these I'll deal with quickly and two I'll give you some examples from. Work made for hire. It's unusual, but uh, sometimes a publisher will say the work is a work made for hire. Um, and when they say that, what that means is that the employer, the publisher, owns the copyright from the beginning. There is no transfer necessary because if the author agrees that it was a work made for hire, I actually doubt the legality of these agreements, that they're enforceable under U.S. law. But um, Occasionally, a publisher, Oxford University Press, has been doing this for multi-author books. 
edited volumes where there's a different author for each chapter. They claim that the essays are work made for hire. Um, why would they do that? Well, as I said, they own the copyright from the start. There is no need for an assignment, and there's very little room for dispute or negotiation. Um, it also means that if it's a work made for hire, an open access policy at the institution that creates a license would never take effect because the author never held the copyright under this fiction called work made for hire. And finally, it means that that right of reversion the right of authors to get out of contracts after 35 years um, would never happen. It doesn't happen with work made for hire. So in most cases, older licenses, an author can say, you know, I, I don't like what I agreed to. I want to get out of it. And the law says they can do that. They can get a second bite at the apple um, unless it was a work made for hire. Uh, the other thing about governing law, before we go on, I want to mention just governing law. This is mostly about the convenience um, of the publisher and saving them money. They don't want to have to, if they have a dispute with an author, go to every possible jurisdiction where there might be a university with a faculty author. Um, of course, if you agree to this, you're agreeing that if there is a dispute, you're the one who's going to travel. Um, so if you want a free well, it's not free at all. If you want a, a you pay all expenses trip to some other jurisdiction, uh, go ahead and agree to this. But they're, they're problematic, and you all know that from our uh, license uh, database negotiations, that these kinds of governing law provisions can be very problematic. Of course, our authors don't pay any attention to them. Uh, usually, there's not going to be a dispute, so it doesn't matter. Uh, one of the things I recommend in these contracts, but I've never, I don't know how often uh, the other side will accept it, is that instead of saying this contract is governed by the law of wherever, say any dispute that arises out of this contract will be governed by the law of the jurisdiction where the defendant in the dispute resides, and that jurisdiction shall be the proper uh, venue. The reason you would do that is it's a disincentive to sue. It means if I start a lawsuit, I have to go to where you are. Um, and so that's just one more disincentive. And if you start a lawsuit, you have to come to me. Uh, it's a disincentive to sue. I think it's a creative solution to these uh, uh, to disputes over governing law, but <laughs> I don't know how often you could actually get it in writing. Here's a typical choice of law. Uh, clause. This is from Roman Littlefield. Um, of course, most public institutions that see this in a license or in a contract can't accept it. Uh, most public institutions have to be governed by the law where they are. I'm now at the University of Kansas, and we can only accept Kansas state law. Um, but this is this is typical of the kind of agreement, a kind of clause that you see for governing law. Another thing I want to talk about is money. Um, this is also, by the way, from the same Roman and Littlefield contract. Uh, sometimes authors, especially of monographs, because they, they sometimes get paid for writing monographs, where they almost never do for our journal articles, sometimes they will ask us, is this fair, um, this amount that I'm being paid? Uh, it's a very, very hard question to answer. Uh, royalties tend to be all over the map. Actually, this one, which offers 10% of net sales, is probably pretty good. I just want to note that uh, publishing agreements usually name a base, uh, a base percentage like this, and then they'll make distinctions, hardcover, paperback, and electronic editions. In this case, uh, the publisher says the same schedule applies. It's 10% for all of them. You frequently see contracts where there is a lower percentage for um, electronic editions. Uh, we could have a real debate about why that is. Or that there may be different rates for foreign or domestic sales. Um, and then there's usually a, a clause like this where the publisher says, if we discount the price for one of several reasons why we might, then the royalty is reduced. Perfectly reasonable thing to say. Anyway, it's, it's worth looking at a few of these just so that you can answer the question that authors sometimes ask, whether or not this is fair. Uh, 
Uh, I've seen, I think 10% is pretty good. I've seen ones where there's a complete schedule just like this, and it says 0%. And you wonder why there's a whole half a page of uh, verbiage about, you know, which, what, what discounts there are for electronic editions or discounted editions when there's no royalty anyway. Um, I sometimes think that's done for no purpose other than to insult the uh, authors. But anyway. This one is something that concerns me a lot. This is a non-compete clause. And this one says that the author will not, without the express written consent of the press, furnish to any other publisher any work on the same subject if, in the reasonable opinion of the press, it might damage sales of the first work. Most academics cannot agree to this. They are clearly going to write things that are on the same subject. That's what they do. And newer work may very well damage the uh, sales of the older work, especially in the case I was talking about earlier where, you know, the science no longer supports exactly what I said in that book. Um, in this article, I'm going to explain why my conclusions are now different. You cannot expect an academic to get permission from the first publisher in order to do this. Um, I would never encourage an author to sign a non-compete clause. We see these in monographic publishing, obviously, and we see it in textbook publishing sometimes. Um, you really need at least not to rely simply on the reasonable opinion of the press. There needs to be some better definition of what a conflict would be. There also probably ought to be a time limit on these non-compete clauses. And in fact, in another context, in employment non-compete clauses, the courts have said that they are invalid. They are, in fact, unconstitutional um, unless they have geographic and temporal limitations. So I think we should look for the same kinds of limitations in publication contracts. I've mentioned indemnification a couple of times. Um, and, uh, you know, it's... It's something that our, our authors don't think much about because they think there's not going to be a problem here. Uh, indemnification is about figuring out who bears the risk. And when I look at indemnification clauses, I want to look for some mutuality. I am willing to warrant and indemnify a publisher uh, in regard to things I have control over. And I want them to warrant and indemnify me for things that they have control over. So I would avoid indemnification, I would avoid one-sided indemnification, and I would avoid um, any dispute language, language that says, we'll indemnify the publisher for any dispute. Um, you can't really promise that. <laughs> um, and again, public institutions usually cannot accept indemnification. So if this is the institution being asked rather than an individual, uh, they probably cannot agree to it. And maybe that should give our authors a little bit of pause. If the university won't agree to it, do you really think you should? Here's a warranty and indemnification from PNAS. You warrant that it's original, it's not been previously published, it's true and accurate. It really should say to the best of the knowledge and belief of the author. Uh, <laughs> Um, it does not infringe any copyright, proprietary, or personal right of any third party. That presumably personal right there also means it's not defamatory. Um, and that permission has been obtained for each, uh, what does it say, for anything that's owned by a third party. Each author identified in the manuscript must sign this form. Uh, and the author shall indemnify the academy for, uh, for any for claims, costs, and expenses of any dispute arising out of a breach of this warranty or other representations. A couple of things I'd be nervous about here, the language of other representations. What other representations? What besides this warranty would invoke indemnification? I'd worry about that. And then, um, I'm sorry, I've just lost my place here. Uh, I would worry about, um, who defines published? You know, it's been, you warrant that it's not been published before. Does that mean preprints? Is that dealt with elsewhere in the, um, in the contract? And then one thing I would really look for here 
is it says that the author shall pay all claims, costs, and expenses, including attorney's fees. I want to know in an indemnification clause who has control over the defense, who actually makes the decisions that lead to costs, expenses, and attorney's fees. Uh, if I, as the author, am promising to pay those, I want to make sure that I, as the author, control the legal action, um, can say, look, we're going to walk away now. Uh, I don't want the control to be in somebody else's hands, but the expense to be borne by me. Last slide, just some advice about drafting an agreement. Um, as I said at the beginning, a lawyer can help with the right wording, but it's your goals and your intent that should drive the uh, contents of any agreement. Think about contracts in terms of risk management. That's what those indemnification clauses are all about. They're about distributing the risk. Um, of course, the other side wants to make you bear all the risk. You want to make the other side bear all the risk. It, there should be some mutuality here. Um, think about your particular market. That was the mistake Syracuse University made uh, in adopting that contract. And in drafting any agreement, some basic respect for authors, I think, is called for. In one of the ones we've looked at, there was this language about contributor and contribution. I personally hate that language. It is part and parcel to my mind of that work for hire mentality, that you work for me as the publisher, and um, I call all the shots. I, I would avoid that language even if I'm still writing a fairly one-sided contract just because I think that authors deserve and seldom get a little bit of respect in this process. Uh, I'm going to finish there. I was going to talk a little about CC licenses, but let's see what the questions are. Thanks, Kevin. I love business cats. Um, there was a question. I apologize. I uh, got kicked out of the, the uh, meeting and then came back in and it erased my chat history. I saw there was a question from Claudia. Do you see that question, Kevin? Should we encourage monograph authors to include a rights reversion statement in the original publication contract? Um, yeah, another question as well, but yeah, go ahead and take that one. All right. Well, yeah, I think that's a perfectly good thing to encourage authors to do. As I said, the law actually contains a rights reversion provision, but it's 35 years out. Uh, many monograph contracts used to include a, if the book goes out of print, rights revert to the author clause. That's hard to include now because out of print doesn't really mean much in a print-on-demand era. So I, but I think it's a good thing to do. And just remember that you need to define the circumstances in which rights return to the author. That is, out of print is not going to be good enough. You may want to say, you know, no more than two copies per year for two years, something like that that defines exactly the circumstances in which rights revert. Ah, here's the other one from agreements authors are signing with OA publishers to pay a certain APC if the paper is accepted. Yeah, you know, if if I understand this question correctly, if the APC does not match the published uh, schedule, uh, for many of us who administered uh, author funds, that would be a sign of a disqualified publication. One of the ways we would look for potentially predatory publishers was, are there fees published and available publicly, and of course then, are <laughs> the fees that are published actually honest? Is it really what's charged? Uh, so I, I would be very concerned about this as well. Um, so this is the, the fee that's being... Now, if it's a submission fee rather than a publication fee, there are a few publications now that use submission fees. I know of one journal that requires... It's a journal for a scholarly society. It's open access. But it says that if you're not a member of the society, you pay a submission fee. And that's, that's paid whether or not the article is accepted or published. But it should be significantly lower than APCs. It should be in the $20 range, not the $2,000 range. 